Welcome to the Exodus Cry podcast, where we have honest conversations around exploitation, trafficking, sexual culture, and justice. So Helen Taylor, our Vice President of Impact, is, <laughs> and uh, we've been on this journey together for a while. There's a lot of people who are, have just gotten to know Exodus Cry over these past few years since we started really highlighting and addressing the subject of pornography in a more focused way. So I thought we could just take some time today as we're kind of rebooting this podcast to, to pull in the entire audience of those that have been tracking with us and to give a bit of that update over the past few years. Yeah. And this is an exciting day because it's the first podcast we've done in three years. We're officially relaunching the Exodus Cry podcast. And many of you over the last couple of years have been reaching out and asking when when is it going to re relaunch? And we had quite a few um, massive moves as an organization and then COVID hit. And so uh, there's been a few things um, you know, that needed to fall into place before we could restart. But yeah, I think that would be so great. Even catching catching our followers up, like what have we been doing the last two years and and kind of who, who we are a bit. Absolutely. So I is Benji Nolo. <laughs> our CEO and founder, filmmaker. <laughs> For anyone that doesn't know leader. me. Uh, the, the thing that I think most people now at this current moment would immediately identify with is the trafficking hub campaign that uh, we launched back in 2020. And so there are a number of people out there who have signed the petition and shared our short animated video, I've been really involved in kind of supporting the effort to hold Pornhub accountable for enabling and profiting from videos of real abuse and trafficking and uh, and all the non-consensual criminal pornographic videos that were being hosted and profited from on their website. So, but I think that what, for those who have entered, so to speak, through that door, may not have a, a full picture of the behind the scenes of what's been going on at Exodus Cry during the, you know. Or even like, why would an anti-trafficking organization suddenly start talking about porn? And so even knowing that it didn't just happen as a flash in the pan moment, there was a long lead up to us doing this. Exactly. Yeah. And so I just want to take a little bit of time just to, for us just to kind of give some backdrop to that and kind of bring people up to speed on what's been happening and where we are currently and where we go from here. So I think that, I mean, I'd love to hear uh, from your perspective as well on just kind of the subject of pornography. But for me, the issue really started to stand out as a, a critical issue, this, this, this issue of the widespread kind of, um, proliferation of pornography in our generation really became a focal point during the time that I was uh, traveling the world and filming Nefarious. So in 2008, we set out on this journey to do a documentary on global sex trafficking and really wanted to just give a perspective of what was happening in the world related to this issue of trafficking as a way to kind of let people know what's going on, why it's going on. And, um, and during the course of that time started to run into pornography, run into the ways that pornography was overlapping and intersecting with sex trafficking. So like yourself, for a lot of people who are tracking with us, we can recall those first moments of learning about trafficking and the visceral nature of the injustice and just how deeply that, that pierced our heart and the burden that was imparted to us as a result of that. And that burden of, my God, I can't 
imagine, I can't believe the things that are happening to people out there, you know, being forced into a lifestyle, essentially systematic rape is just so beyond anything I can possibly wrap my mind around. And so there was a compelling aspect to really trying to uncover why is this going on and, and the nuts and bolts of the actuality and the reality of what was going on. And especially as filming a documentary, you know, where there was a, a greater sense of burden of it's, this isn't just my own personal interest, but we're really trying to provide answers to people out there who may also either not know about this or just being awakened to this and, and want to learn more. Yeah. And I, I think it's something that has really marked the entire identity of the organization from that of um, even you filming Nefarious, you set out to tell the story about trafficking, but you unearthed all these other questions of like, well, what are they, they're trafficked into prostitution and how, like, let's go further upstream. Um, what causes demand for prostitution? I remember um, you are often saying that you came back from filming in Amsterdam, haunted by the image of, of men lining up outside the brothels after you've interviewed these women behind the windows and you come out seeing scores of men lining up to purchase access to the vulnerable bodies of the women being sold and exploited. And that haunting image of how did we as a Western civilization get here? And most of those men are, were American, were British, European, Australian. Um, I remember you saying these guys don't typically just wake up one day and decide to go and buy a woman in Amsterdam or buy a child in Cambodia. How do they get there? And asking those deeper questions um, as a as a filmmaker is basically what began the whole journey to to even addressing pornography. Would you say? Totally. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really. And when we think about human trafficking, I just think it's so important to understand that it's not something that happens in a vacuum. And again, the idea of like becoming aware that trafficking is happen is happening. The idea is to activate enough of an interest in people to want to do something to change that. And so that was a, a really compelling question for us of how do we bring an end to this? So I want to just kind of give the, the bigger picture bullet points of what we began to discover about pornography and how that kind of reshaped our focus as an organization and then where that took us. Yeah, I think that'll be really helpful for people to even understand that because we don't often even talk about the that process that led us to this point. For sure. So 2008, um, I'm on this journey. I am traveling the world, investigating sex trafficking, and I begin to discover these five specific ways that pornography was overlapping and intersecting with sex trafficking. So the first one was that we noticed when we were going to different red light districts around the world that they were using pornography to market the women who were being used in prostitution. So if you go to Amsterdam, they have, you know, cards, pornographic cards made up of women who are actually being sold in the windows and they'll hand them to you and say, hey, if you want to buy such and such, go here. And, and so pornography was being used to market the people in prostitution uh, who were being commercially exploited, many of them sex trafficking victims. So that was the first thing. The second was that beyond just the marketing of the women using pornography to market them, we began as we were talking with, with trafficking victims, we discovered that a lot of them had been forced to appear in pornography, which was another like really important discovery because it, it, it kind of changes your whole perspective of pornography when you realize that a lot of these women who are being sex trafficked are being forced to appear in pornography. So for the viewer who's behind the screen, you, when you click on that button, you really don't know who it is that 
you're watching. And some people would say, well, yeah, but I just, I just stick to the mainstream, uh, you know, pornography. And even at that level, well, this, I'll just make this our third discovery. The third discovery. So there's the first discovery was it was being used. Pornography was being used to market women in prostitution. The second was sex trafficking victims were being forced to appear in pornography. The third one that we discovered is that there, there's an element of trafficking that happens even in the mainstream, quote unquote, like above board porn industry. So there's a cover narrative of the mainstream porn industry that would say all these women are empowered, they're liberated, they choose this, this is what they deserve, this is what they want. There's this idea that there's this subclass of human beings who exist for no other purpose than to be you know, used sexually. Um, when we were making another film and investigating the porn industry, which we'll get into in a bit, I remember sitting down with a contract star from one of the larger porn companies. So by all intensive purposes, this would be a mainstream, above board pornography production company with one of the most well-known pornography performers in the industry. And when we sat down to do the interview, I hadn't even asked a question yet. And she just offered to me, she said, um, I've never told anybody this before, but she said, I feel like I just want, I, like, I just want to share this with you now. So she begins to share her story and her story involves how she was trafficked into pornography. And I just sat there with, you know, my jaw dropped of, you know, even seeing everything that I had to that point to have somebody confide that who, again, appeared to be um, somebody who had chosen this, wanted this, was enjoying this, was actually somebody who was trafficked into the industry. Twitter is uh, a platform that we've criticized a lot because of the way that they feature pornography. So they they welcome 13 year olds to their plat to use their platform, but then they, you know, proliferate the most hardcore graphic porn on their platform. Well, people in the porn industry use Twitter as a marketing for their porn videos and their branding, and so there's a lot of individual porn performers on there. If you were accessing this person's Twitter page that who I was talking with, that you would get a certain impression of who this person was that again, that this person had chosen this, wanted this, loved it, all of that was being paid good money for it. That's the impression that you would get. And that's the impression that a lot of consumers at home have is well, this is just this person who this is, you know, and that's their rationalization. That's their justification. So it was really interesting to sit and talk with somebody, even at that level, um, not somebody who we met, you know, in Eastern Europe that was, had been, uh, gorilla pimped into, a, a prostitution trafficking situation and then was strong armed into performing in porn. This, there's, this was, in Los Angeles, the one of the biggest porn production companies out there, and one of their paid contract performers who is confiding her story of trafficking, and um, and so so there's a lot to say about that. But I wanted to highlight that because I think it's a really it was a really profound discovery for us and an insight and a realization into the fact that, uh, that we just don't know what's happening behind the scenes and a lot of this pornography that's being created. Right. So again, so first thing, pornography is being used to market prostitution and people being trafficked. People in trafficking centers are forced to make pornography. And the third discovery was that even in the mainstream porn industry, there was an element of trafficking that was happened, which we'll elaborate more on, but I'll pause there for a second. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, there's, there are so many intersections and it's so important for people to really understand that it's, um, it, they're not completely different separate categories. And I remember one of the first qu quotes I heard about pornography was it's, um, it's a, a form of, 
prostitution or commercial sex with a camera in the room and inviting a camera in the room somehow um, provides all these rights. But um, there's often the same amount of trauma, PTSD. Uh, for me, the first time I made the connection between porn and trafficking was when I was living in Cambodia. And one of the women in our program that I was interviewing had been trafficked from a rural, rural village, age 11. And while she was being trafficked as a teen in this brothel in Phnom Penh, men, typically Western men, would come in and show her porn on their phones and tablets and ask her to recreate what she was seeing, what they were seeing. And that was the first moment that I really was like, this is the first testimony I've heard from a survivor who's made the connection between demand and porn. And I think that most people, the, the first examples you just gave, a lot of people don't even think about. Um, they just think, well, um, porn and trafficking are connected because demand leads to, to trafficking. Um, and that is the case. Every sex buyer, I believe, that you've ever interviewed, it began with a, a porn addiction and the, the fantasy of, of something that they want to then go out and experience and taste for themselves. Um, and pornography being the marketing force, um, creating that fantasy, presenting that fantasy to people who are potentially buy it, become buyers. And we have a lot of compassion for people who are exposed to porn as children, and that's something we're going to tap into later. Um, but I think porn as a fuel for demand is another um, central intersection. Yeah. So that would be like the fourth, and it did. The order doesn't matter, but I, I think it's it is important to to nail down that there are these there's this number of very specific ways mm -hmm. that pornography intersects with sex trafficking, and um, so as we began to talk with the buyers, which was inevitable as we were out in red light districts filming this documentary on sex trafficking. We talked to pimps, we talked to trafficker, you know, pimps and traffickers, I use them synonymously. Um, we talked to um, people who were currently victims as well as survivors, those who had gotten out. We talked to law enforcement, government officials. We talked to experts on so many different levels. And we really, I mean, we, we I, when I think about the number of interviews that we did, I mean, probably 90% of them didn't even get used in the film. We were just wow. talking to so many people. and But we talked to the buyers. We talked to men who had who were going into these red light districts or who had traveled to Cambodia or, you know, when we were filming here in the U.S. And, um, and without question, the one commonality between all of them, between all of the men who were purchasing women in prostitution was the fact that they had a prior history of pornography consumption from childhood. Mm -hmm. So these men who were now acting out and renting women's bodies to masturbate into in different parts of the world didn't start out that way. They didn't wake up one day and decide, I'm going to go fly halfway around the world to Cambodia to go buy a child for sex, or I'm going to go enact some very twisted fantasy onto, you know, a quote unquote high class escort in Las Vegas. These people had reached this point um, over a period of years that for all of them started again as innocent children having their first exposure to pornography. So when we think about this larger issue of sex trafficking, we often talk at Exodus Cry a lot about the demand side of this equation because it's such a critical part of how we bring an end to it, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a supply and demand issue. So the demand for illicit sex is what's fueling the need for trafficking, for people there just aren't enough people signing up saying, oh, let, you know. Uh, so that's where the element of trafficking comes in, getting people into these positions to be able to satisfy the deviant, the often deviant, perverse sexual appetites of men seeking out illicit sex. So the fourth issue where pornography is intersected is the role that it plays in 
cultivating the demand for illicit sex. So it's, it's right there at the very core, at the root of sex trafficking mm. is demand and pornography cultivating that demand, fueling that demand, incubating um, that demand. It's, it's the soil, so to speak, that the seeds and the roots of demand grow up into is that exposure to pornography and then where that takes a person. Not that it takes every person there, but it takes enough there that it's really important to point out yeah. that this is a key point of intersection between pornography and sex trafficking. Yeah. And I know that the the fifth intersection being the website, the tube website distribution side, but that's even more of a recent phenomena. And I feel like even just you seeing those first four intersections 10 years ago, when you came back from filming Nefarious was when you called some of our staff into that room, had that um, memorable whiteboarding session of we we can't only talk about sex trafficking. We have to delve into the, the roots. We have to look at pornography. Um, we often use Exodus Cry, the, the tree analogy of um, the rotting fruit of the result of sex trafficking, um, victims in, in suffering being a if they're the, the fruit um, on this tree analogy, just so to speak, um, and the branch could be a, a, uh, a trafficking ring that's supporting that. Even if you um, assist 10 or 100 victims out of sex trafficking, um, as long as there's a thriving tree, more will grow back. Even if you arrest a trafficker and it's cutting off a branch with 10 um, victims, again, that will, as long as there's still a demand, um, that will continue to grow. There'll continue to be vulnerable people recruited in. And so we, we say that the, um, the trunk is the system of prostitution, uh, the commercial sex industry, which includes pornography as a, a system and an industry. The roots are demand, um, but roots only thrive in a pornographic soil. And so it was several years ago when we began to use this kind of analogy of we want to go after the demand, we want to go after um, pulling this up from the roots. We have to talk about demand a lot of organizations um, only talk about assisting the victims, only talk about um, trafficking cases, but don't acknowledge demand. Um, and you know, we totally get that different organizations have their different emphasis and lanes. But for us, it truly feels central to the entire strategic plan of how we go about abolishing sex trafficking in our lifetime, which is the mission of Exodus Cry. We have to pull it up by the roots. We have to address demand um, and not only supply. If we want to reduce supply, we have to go after demand and the roots of demand thrive in a pornographic soil. This is the tree analogy. Um, but I just think that's always a helpful picture to even give that context of around demand. Um, and it was only, um, yeah, so in those years, you, our other colleague, uh, former director of abolition, Lila Micklewaite, spent years researching everything under the sun on porn. I remember Lila and I shared an office and she just had book after book on porn. And you were reading everything that you could possibly find out, every report ever written, um, and began writing this book that will come out later this year. Um, but what was that, yeah, that research project like for all those years? So before we get ahead into that, which, yeah, is just such, it's been such a, such an interesting journey in how all of this unfolded. Mm -hmm. um, I want to highlight just the last thing, because I want our viewers and the people who are tracking with us to be able to to carry this as well, to be able to rattle off the five areas, yeah. you know, that pornography intersects with sex trafficking. Because since we've started pushing back against pornography in a number of different ways, there's there's been a backlash to that. And a lot of people who are pornography consumers or who have a deep belief in the value of pornography, um, have had a very uh, strong reaction to us trying to bring accountability into that space. But a lot of people would just say that, oh, pornography is harmless. You know, if, if we're, if you're commenting somewhere on social media, there's just such a widespread acceptance of 
pornography and this is just kind of the way things are and you know and it, the what I said before the cover narrative of porn this is harmless fun it's just and you guys are just a bunch of you know sexual prudes whatever whatever is said all that stuff so too, too moral too ethical yeah so for us it, it's 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 really not about that it's really a, it was a process of discovering these ways that pornography intersected and overlapped with sex trafficking that made it a very important issue to us to focus on and to focus on in very specific ways. It's, we're not out there trying to stop people from having sex. <laughs> like that's not like it's, we, we are trying to address some of the, the key aspects of exploitation that's happening in pornography and the way that it's fueling exploit exploitation. And so, um, so the fifth thing that we discovered as we were out kind of filming and interviewing people and, and investigating trafficking was that pornography was used to groom victims and specifically victims of child sex trafficking. So there were ways that pornography overlapped in the, the world of prostitution according to a number of survivors who shared. I mean, I would say, I, I can't think of a survivor who shared their story with us that, that didn't at some point mention how pornography was involved with a lot of these interactions. So where men would come and actually bring pornography and say, I want you to enact this. So there was that. But what I'm talking about is specifically where trafficking rings, you know, operating, in places like Cambodia that were acquiring uh, a lot of children through illicit means. So paying off parents or outright abduction or s somehow getting a hold of these kids, bringing them into a trafficking situation and then using pornography as the way to groom them, as the way to say, here's what's going to be expected of you. So these poor children, you know, some of them as young as you know six, seven years old have no experience with any sexuality at all. And their first experience is now being shown this, this pornography and not having a paradigm, a worldview, the biopsychosocial development, emotional maturity to even place or frame what they're seeing. It's just, you know, you, you will do this. And, and then those children being expected to enact those sexual acts that they were being forced to watch. So that was one of the most disturbing things that we discovered was how pornography was being used to groom children. I just, I just find that particularly disturbing and troubling. And um, so, yeah, so those are the five areas. Okay, I'm gonna quiz you. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Oh gosh. Um, well, welcome back. Uh, pornography is used to to groom, groom children. Um, it is a marketing force, the fuel of demand. Um, women are being trafficked into even the legal porn industry. Um, uh, pornography is used to advertise women in prostitution. Um, and online distribution, do we classify that as the, the fifth one or what's, what was the second one? So, okay, so you got, we're gonna give you an A minus. <laughs> so I think you got four out of the five. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I usually only talk about three, so I, I'm learning about the, the two more that. There might be one or <laughs> two that we're missing too, that. but yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking of it in this kind of linear way on this journey of making it the things that stood out to me. So it was first realizing, oh, they're using pornography to market the women who are being trafficked. And then the women are, who are being trafficked are, all, are forced to be in pornography. And, and uh, so it's the marketing of the women. It was that some of them were being forced to make pornography. And then, um, and then people in the mainstream- Legal, yeah. Yeah, legal porn industry. There was also an element of trafficking. And then the, the fourth thing was that it was fueling the demand 
for illicit sex, for trafficking, essentially. And then the fifth thing was that it was uh, being used to groom children who were being trafficked. So those are the, the five primary ways, like primary, really concrete ways that pornography was intersecting with sex trafficking. So in the four years that we took to make Nefarious, that thread was was there. It was, there was a very kind of prominent realization, obvious uh, realization that pornography was a part, a part of this whole larger equation of sex trafficking. But making a documentary, we were limited in time and space to what we could actually include in the film. And so we didn't, so we didn't feel like we had the, the bandwidth with that first documentary, Nefarious Merchant of Souls, to elaborate on these ways that pornography was intersecting with sex trafficking. And so we released Nefarious and uh, had a very successful, I would say like grassroots kind of release of Nefarious, opened up a lot of doors for us. Um, and that took on a whole dimension. But after about a year, a uh, year, year and a half, of getting Nefarious out there, we circled the wagons again and kind of brought our team back together and came back around to this issue of pornography and to the, lar the, to the issue of the larger sexual culture in America mm. and whiteboarded a session back in 2012 going, you know, we've there are these ways where pornography is intersecting with sex trafficking. We really have to take a deeper look at this. I knew it was going to take some time. I didn't think it would take eight years before we would kind of step out and begin to report some of our findings. And also that all of that would be able to be fitted into one documentary when it actually there's multiple stories within the issue of demand and our sexual culture at large. So that's why... Um, yeah, we made several film projects that spun into that, you know, like liberated the spring break story couldn't just be like segued in, um, while talking about sex buyers, like that became its own story. Um, and a documentary on sex buyers, a documentary on a series on the, uh, the legal porn industry and exploitation happening there. I mean, it's, there's just so much and we couldn't jumble it all together in one film. So that's partly why, um, and how, all these other film projects began to take on a life of their own. We always start with this ambition of we're going to make this documentary and we're going to tie together all these things. Mm -hmm. And, and then the project ends up splintering into multiple things because to really tell a story well, and in a kind of robust and in-depth way, it's just really difficult you know, to tie all, to tie everything together. So, but in 2012, we set out to make one documentary, which mm -hmm. is now splintered into, I don't even know how many, <laughs> but the idea was to really uncover the larger sexual culture of America that was fueling demand. And as a significant part of that, the role of pornography. And, um, and so from that moment, from that moment in 2012, is when I would say that, you know, I know for myself that I, I made a really strong pivot into focusing um, almost exclusively on the subject of pornography. And that began with a trip going into the porn industry to begin making a documentary, um, interviewing people in porn, interviewing performers, agents, producers, talking to the, the gatekeepers of the porn industry and the interested parties of the porn industry. And, um, and then our other colleague at the time, Lila, began digging into all the research that had been done on pornography, all the books that had been written, all the journals that had been written. And together, we ended up spending eight years uh, like digging really deep into all of that before our, before our season would change and we begin to start coming out with all of our findings. But that was, yeah, it started back in 2012, that focus, that, that shift in direction. 
And so with the trafficking hub campaign that turned into a movement, there was all these years of of research and digging and prayer as well, like years and years of praying um, for justice for survivors and feeling like there's a huge spotlight and awareness on the issue of sex trafficking. I feel like globally, worldwide, um, lots of awareness was taking place, um, lots of major governmental shifts and improvements in policy and legislation, lots of organizations starting, lots of safe homes opening, um, but pornography and trafficking um, wasn't really emphasized in the way that um, we knew at one point there would be a moment when we would start really speaking out about this in a very focused and public way. And during that time, like during those eight years, we continued our anti-trafficking work. And during those eight years, we, we splintered into some different focuses. We made the documentary uh, that's available on Netflix, Liberated, about hookup culture and kind of the stories we tell in pop culture that socialize us into our conceptions of gender and sexuality. And uh, so, so there were some other things that we were weaving at the time. But I, one thing that I remember during the course of those eight years is I remember a growing anti-porn sentiment that started to feel like it was pregnant in the culture. In other words, there was, well, so there was a couple things going on. One is that I would say that pornography has not only gotten progressively more deviant and uh, disturbing, but at the same time more celebrated, which is, I mean, it's obviously disturbing, but it's also in a way, uh, a reflection of our culture and where we're at. Um, but there was, so there's, so there was this escalation, this evolution of pornography since the inception of the inter internet mm. in which pornography has just become more and more deviant, more violent, more fantasies of young kids, like more just pushing way past whatever boundaries exist around sexuality and, and culture. And, but alongside that, this is the part that, that I find really interesting is this celebration of pornography and culture. So I think Pornhub is just such a great example of this from the standpoint that they were the most guilty in terms of hosting and promoting and profiting from videos of this progressively more deviant content while at the same time endearing themselves to the culture. They would sponsor New York Fashion Week. They would host, they would uh, have billboard advertisements in Times Square. They really made an intentional effort to try to become the tongue in cheek, wink, wink, brand of pornography. They were endorsed by celebrities. I remember when Kanye or Ye West um, mentioned them and um, he was offered a free subscription for life in a kind of jokey way, like, oh, he, he endorsed us. They had pop-up shops in Times Square as well, um, like for Valentine's Day. Um, and even, yeah, the New York Fashion Week, this is the beginning of 2020. So right at the beginning of that year, was probably when they were at the top of their game in terms of um, pop culture, marketing, celebrity endorsements, to have a whole sh New York Fashion Week catwalk dedicated to your brand. They'd, um, they'd really become more mainstream than any other porn website by far. People who didn't even watch porn had heard of Pornhub. So I think as this was happening, as their brand was growing in visibility and flourishing, alongside the progressively more deviant nature of pornography, I think there were a lot of people who understood that something was wrong, understood that, which, I mean, it doesn't take a mathematician to figure that out. <laughs> like, I think a lot of people could just take one visit to their website and realize like, wow, this is, this is really, uh, 
this is really awful stuff. But I think there was a growing sense that uh, peop- that a lot of people had that this is not right. Something is not right here. And um, so there was this intersection of events and this perfect storm that emerged in which a growing anti-porn sentiment was occurring in the culture, while at the same time the deviance in porn was accelerating, while at the same time a company like Pornhub was really putting themselves out there as this pop culture brand to just sort of make it all okay. And all these things were kind of intersecting. So when we were researching this, I was very aware. I I had this awareness that the moment we actually begin to come out with and report on some of our findings is it's going to, it's going to galvanize people. It's going to create for a lot of people, it, it kind of give this, like give them a voice to the vicarious outrage that they were feeling, but didn't have language for, or maybe didn't understand in a really concrete way or in-depth way, what it was that they were having their misgivings over. Just like, oh man, this stuff is awful. So And meanwhile, in the news, I remember in 2019, there was like just a few hints of cases that were mentioned. They didn't get, uh, they didn't kind of blow up in culture, um, but we were just beginning to really pay attention to them. And the one case that really does come to mind was um, the case of this 15 year old missing girl from Florida and she was trafficked, she was missing for a year. 58 videos of her were discovered on Pornhub. That was how she was even found. And I remember it being like, wait, how did 58 videos of an underage missing trafficked girl get up, get on Pornhub under a verified account? And that was a case that really like deeply troubled us and uh, led to us looking into Pornhub specifically. Um, um, and there'd been a couple of other reports by that point. The Internet Watch Foundation, the Sunday Times from the UK had found uh, exploited individuals as young as three uh, on the on the site. But I just don't feel like those reports were were talked about by the whole anti-trafficking movement. It wasn't like mainstream news. Yeah. So just to kind of recap our conversation so far. So I'm I'm trying to to kind of piece this together for people to to help track with our journey and, and what the, the emphasis on porn has grown out of. So, so there was the initial burden of my God, sex trafficking is happening. My, in my head, you know, just predominantly women and children and among children, boys and girls who are in situations where they're being forced into lives of prostitution, this whole, this whole awful issue of sex trafficking and everything that we know about that led us on a journey to make this documentary on global sex trafficking. And during that time, discovered these five ways that pornography was intersecting and overlapping with sex trafficking. So that created the impetus to then revisit that subject after Nefarious was released and make a concrete conscious decision to investigate pornography further. And then over the course of these eight years began to make further discoveries. Mm. And, and, uh, and then those discoveries culminated at the end of 2019 into this emphasis on coming out with our findings about pornography and, and trafficking hub being kind of the first manifestation of that, of saying, hey, we have discovered this about what's going on in the world of trafficking. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think that people's hearts were just, uh, many people were disturbed by what they had seen going on. There was anti-porn sentiment that was pregnant among many people. And I think it, that spark of coming out was like sparking a keg of gunpowder and it just exploded. The out, the level of outrage, the level of of uh, response from people wanting to actively lend their voice and participate in bringing this accountability was absolutely incredible. So, just to kind of 
summarize and pull us into that moment that ended in 2019 at the beginning of 2020 and the trafficking hub campaign begins to become a focus. Mm. So I think for right now, for, for this first podcast, I think this is a good place to end. Uh, I, it seems I, like the catch up of even leading up until the moment I, we, we <laughs> overly ambitious to, to hope that we could talk about the entire campaign. This, the context needed to be given, I think, for how we even got to a place of launching this global campaign and movement, um, holding Pornhub accountable. So I think that that was really, really helpful to hear those intersections broken down. And we always want anyone who um, tracks with us to feel educated and empowered to the point where they could, if anyone, a family member, they're at a dinner party, someone from their church or community asks them any of these questions, we would want them to be able to articulate some of these um, these things. So I'm really glad you broke them down so yeah. systemically. Yeah. Good. So we'll end it here. And then on the next one, we'll jump into the actual campaigns that we've How it been all unfolded. Yeah, working on and a part of over these past number of over these past few years. And the Trafficking Hub campaign would be one of those and Protect Children Not Porn campaign and now the End Teen Porn campaign. So some really important campaigning that has begun to take shape over these last few years. We'll jump into that on the next one. Sounds good. You can check out all our podcast episodes, articles, and films at ExodusCry.com. And join the daily conversation by following Exodus Cry on all major social platforms.